charger, new leader of the Dodge Rebellion, muscle enough to catch anything on the road. Available with four barrels, dual exhaust, V8 power, hideaway headlights, four roomy bucket seats, fabulous new full-size fastback. The Dodge Charger made its debut in the fall of 1965 and never looked back. Today, it is one of the most desirable and valuable muscle cars on the planet. With the paintwork and undercoating complete on our 1966 Dodge Charger, it's time to install the drivetrain. Option from the factory with a legendary 426 Hemi, four-speed manual transmission, and painted in ultra-rare ZZ1 Gold Poly. This car is guaranteed to steal the show. So sit back and enjoy. This is Graveyard Cars. You'll be surprised. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest, one team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman. His cousin, Doug his daughter, Alyssa, his best friend, Royal, his painter, Will, and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest, fiercest, and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. So in our 1966 Dodge Charger 426 Hemi four speed car, we are really close to installing the drivetrain. We've spent quite a bit of time building it all out. Doug and I have a couple little things to do to it before it goes in, but really it's ready to go in. Now this is the car that Will painted the ZZ1 gold most recently you saw if you go back through one of the episodes. Gorgeous color, gorgeous car. I have no doubt that it's one of one when you actually break down the colors, the options, the fact that it's a 426 Hemi and a four speed, I guarantee you that's a one of one. So I am really excited to get this car's drivetrain in it. Getting the wheels, tires, uh, blue line tires, by the way, gonna look absolutely awesome. So last things we got to do on our Hemi now are the fuel filters. This is kind of a unique system. Dougie and I have not done one of these before. It's all new. This 66 Charger is one of the first ones I've ever worked on. And although a lot of the Hemis from 66 to 71 have a lot of similarities, there are also a few minute differences, and it's really nice to have Tony's parts to rely on for technical advice. I actually had to reference Tony's pictures. He's got a lot of pictures of his 66 satellite. It was like an 8,000-mile survivor car. So wow. if I didn't have those, I'd be in trouble because I have never done this system. So now here's a great example of not who you know, who I know. So Tony D'Agostino, Tony's Mopar Parts. He had a beautiful survivor 1966 hemi satellite he sold it recently this car was as pure as the driven snow everything original everything original right down to the fuel filters which in this particular case you'll see is why it was so important to me to get photos of it back when tony did have the car he took the time to document it and it's those photos that's allowing me to be able to put this 66 together and look correct in 6871, this takes the place of the filters. It just bolts on. If you go look at that 71 CUDA that we've got over there, you know how it goes on into place, and then the fuel lines go in and out of it. It works as a filter and a fuel vapor separator, where we're using these little jobs here. So let me clarify this. So in 1966 and 1967, if you had a 426 Hemi, it was inline dual four carburetors. They wanted to run one filter for each one of those carburetors. That's what you see us putting on. A filter for the front carburetor, a filter for the back one, they're all synced together. In 1968, the Street Hemi, the 426 Street Hemi, again still had inline dual fours all the way up through 71, its demise. But it used, instead of the two filters, it used a fuel vapor separator. This thing did two jobs. It helped a lot with vapor locking and it doubled as a fuel filter. So all we've got to do is put those in line. Think we can handle that? We can give it a try, All can't right. we? I think we can give it a try, me and my cousin Dougie here. So just to clarify, the difference is 66 and 67, two filters in line up near the carburetors. 68 to 71, fuel vapor separated, bolted to the fuel pump using a line in, a line out, and one back to the tank. 
Okay. But I'm gonna want the KV showing so we can look like we know what we're doing. And then let me grab a clamp. I'll put this one on to here. You'll have to move it. All right. I'm gonna nice. go ahead and try and install that rear one there. Uh-huh. So when we were growing up, we could only dream about Hemi cars. Seems like no one in our circle had one. But here we are years later, and we get to work on these things all the time, and it is so cool. But you'll notice all the lines are loose right now. You see everything's loose like it should. Well, that one's not totally loose, but it will move. Interestingly, on the six-pack setup, the center carburetor is only 350 CFM. The two outboard carburetors are 500 each. So that's a total of 1,350 CFM, more than the Hemi has. Dougie's had a bad time with gasoline and cars over the years, so, well. What, what the prices? Well, yeah, he has a problem with those two. I was talking about the time you burned your father-in-law's shed down to the ground. I never burned my father-in-law's shed down. I'm sorry. All my prized motorcycles were in there. So we had a shop fire when I was a teenager. Some sparks from a fire nearby caught our shop on fire. It was a super hot fire, and our shop burned completely to the ground. How, how exactly again did that happen? I don't know. Somebody was burning garbage outside the shop, I guess, uh -huh. and somehow it followed the Boom. vegetation on the ground and torched our shop up. Darn fire should have known better than to follow those yeah. old dry weeds into that shop. Why does it want to go after my dirt bike, huh? Yeah, I know your TM400 burnt yeah. it to the ground. My prized possession, I'm right? I'm sorry, that was sad. So my TM400 engine had melted into a shiny puddle of aluminum on the floor. So Why would I do that? I never you did that. You would do that. You're the Why'd best. Why'd you accuse me of that? I apologize. I'm gonna get you another I filter. I forgive you. Okay, got one more heading your way, sir. Awesome. I'm sorry about accusing you of that. That was terrible. You burned you my shop down you with did my not dirt bike in. Why would I do that? He did not shop down. He would not do that. Poor little guy. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I went over to visit him, and the place had burnt up the day before, and he was sitting in the living room all despondent. Now, this is a true story, all right? Doug's 1974 Suzuki TM400 was in the shop when it burned because Doug had pulled the motor down, took the main bearings out of it. It was making a noise. So he took the main bearing out and brought it inside so he could get the number off it and call Eugene Suzuki and order it. Well, in the meantime, while he was doing that, the damn building caught on fire, burned it to the ground, and there was nothing but a molten pile of metal and pot metal and aluminum on the floor of this garage. When I got to Doug's, knock, 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 I go to the door, hey, root red around, what's going on, man? What, what happened? They, they filled me in on the burn. I walked in and he was crouched down up against the wall and he had the main bearing on his finger. They, you can put probably a couple of fingers in there and he was spinning it like this, the outer race, you know, spin, 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 spin. And he just sat there, hey, Doug, man, what happened? I'm sorry about your bike. And he just kept doing that hour after hour. No conversation. Danny Torrance, when he'd vapor lock, start having those visions, you know, those shinnins. He would lock up like that, start drooling down the mouth, and, and you couldn't talk to him, and he in his head. That's what he was doing with that bearing. So right now I'm dedicating my time towards the 69 Charger RT 444 speed car. It's a beautiful car. The customer is really excited to get this car back. They're getting pretty antsy, so Mark's having me focus a lot of time on that car. And the first thing I'm going to do is install the sound deadening. Mark's philosophy is to install this anywhere in the car that's not seen when the whole car is put together. So I install this all over the floor. I try not to miss any spots. I layer it. I may be a little overkill when I do it, but the more sound deadening you put on, the better it just helps in the long run. Now with the second skin installed, I can continue installing the interior on this gorgeous 1969 Charger. going on? Pretty good. Okay. Pretty good. All right. Okay. You know, okay. Pretty good. One thing I will say about this design of the dual filters up there 
near the carburetors. This is a very easy filter to replace. You can see it doesn't take Doug any time to do. Well, if it was in a car, it'd be the exact same thing. Okay, you wanna tighten down your fuel lines? Sure, sure. Okay, we're gonna tighten down our fuel lines here. It's free, right? And while he's tightening those down, I wanted to talk about this front sway bar. 66 to 69 normal front sway bars do not look like this. Now, what I'm talking about on the sway bar is 1965, technically, was the last year for the sway bar that you see on this car. However, it was a rolling change, meaning that it wasn't a hard, fast rule that says, like a 71 Cuda, you won't see a 71 Cuda leave the factory with 70 fenders on it. It was a completely different model. A rolling change means they were going to change it in the middle of the process. So in 65 and prior, they used this unique sway bar, like the one that you see on our car. And in 66, the models were all supposed to have the second generation of sway bar that you see from 66 to 69. So when you look at it, the main differences are on the 65 and older sway bar, it uses a very short link that connects the sway bar to the K-frame. Then at the back, it uses a clamp that actually holds it to the strut rod where if you go over to our 66 to 69, at the K member, at the subframe, it uses a rubber insulated bracket that holds it, very solid. And then it uses a link at the back, very similar to the front ones, but longer, to hold the control arms into place. So it's a, it's a very much a different system. I just wanted to keep it original with the car because that's how it started life. The only thing we have left before we can put this in is the fan assembly. So let me roll that over here. We are making some changes. So you purists out there that are waiting to crucify me, I want you to know, I know the difference, but we are choosing to do this. Originally in 66, it used this four blade fan. Beautiful, huh? Well, we want better cooling than that. So we are going with 216 fan. So this is a brand new reproduction. It's one of Tony's from Tony's Mopar. Seven blades. This one is designed to go with the clutch in the max cooling cars. We're just gonna put it in this one because we don't want any problems. This guy's gonna drive the car all the time. We can use our regular fan shroud with it and this will give it a lot better cooling capacity. Another set of hands. Yeah. Be nice. Okay. There I can you go. Hold that little baby for you there. Thank you. Sure. These Ooh. are tough. These oh, are man. little critters. Almost like surgery, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost Getting like surgery. Started. It is a little tough. So installing these clutch fans in a car it, in such tight quarters is such a horrible job. I don't know how they ever did it on the assembly line. I am so happy to be able to build these engines up on an engine stand and put the fan on. It's hard enough on the engine stand. It's horrible in the car. Yeah, Doug used to work at a little pizza parlor called the Golden Spike years ago. It was a fun place, wasn't it? It was. Dougie worked over at a pizza parlor in Eugene in the evening. It was the greatest thing that ever happened. And my cousin Dougie got a job there. They had a lot of fun. They had video games there. Popeye. Popeye. My favorite. Dougie's favorite game was Popeye, the video game. Free beer. Free beer. What? You got free beer? You know, just because you work there doesn't mean the beer is free. Yeah, the pizzas are free too. Come on over. You come on over after 10 o'clock, the boss is gone. It's free beer and pizza. What about the video games? Yeah, I'll just get some quarters out of the till. <laughs> Last time I checked, that's called embezzling. <laughs> Want this a boss? No, it's free beer and pizza. <laughs> when little boys and girls in TV land, don't be like Dougie. When your boss gives you the keys to some place, respect that. Respect it. Just because you didn't have to write a check doesn't mean it's free. Yep. Yep, that was fun. It was. Once in a while, one of us would drink too much and get a little crazy. That's okay. Choke out the tray. <laughs> Only a few times in our lives did I ever see Dougie lock up like that Danny Torrance thing. And he did it one night at the pizza parlor. We were drinking beers. Oh, this is the best, playing Donkey Kong. Oh, everything's gonna be great. Let's have some of that free pizza. I walk around the back of the counter. Now I did say something insightful because I, part of my charm. I probably said, hey, blank. And he just flipped out. And he put his arms out for, we're talking this stuff. We're talking Night of the Living Dead. You remember in Night of the Living Dead when Johnny was in the graveyard and he says, they're coming to get you, Barbara. And Barbara, stop it, Johnny, you're being stupid. They're here now. And the bad guy comes over and he chokes him out, chokes him out, just got a blank look, because oh, he's a zombie, right? That's Dougie. He held onto my throat in front of me until I turned blue and I was lifeless. And I, and I was swatting at his hands. You know how you, they teach you all that stuff in karate. And he'd swat at the hand, swat at the hand. But I, I started, you know, choking out. And he finally came to his senses and let go. <laughs> 
That's what beer's for. Yes. I believe that should be a Budweiser commercial. <laughs> Absolutely. Budweiser, choke your friend out. <laughs> Might want to stay tuned for my HBO special, Fast Times at Glenwood High. The 1968 Dodge Charger is one of the most collectible muscle cars on the planet today. What movie helped make this car one of the most collectible cars on the planet today? Was it Bullet, Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, Vanishing Point? All right, guys and gals, you should know this one. Take a guess, stay tuned after the break, I'll let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, welcome back. The 1968 Charger, huh? Sexy car, made famous in a movie. What movie was it that made it so classy? If you said Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, you're wrong. <laughs> the answer is Bullet with Steve McQueen. Featuring a black 1968 Dodge Charger RT, the world still loves that movie, mostly because of that car. Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry featured a 1969 Dodge Charger, and Vanishing Point, of course, Kowalski, was driving a 1970 Dodge Challenger, 444 speed in EW1. So today I'm gonna to build out the interior trim panels on the 1969 Charger SE. Before we do that, I'll just kind of point out a couple of cool special things. Basically just on the 68 to 70 Charger models only. What we got right here is the upper door trim pads, which are really cool. They got kind of this like recessed style line that goes down it. When you're talking about the interior on the 68 to 70 Charger, that's a pretty rich interior. Not all of them had this, but this particular car did. My 70 Charger burnt orange car did. It's an upper door pad. Instead of just having the bare metal that you see on a Roadrunner and many of the cars like that, this had a full pad up there. It has the medallion. They're very proud of it being a Dodge Charger. It has a provision in it for the rear view mirror adjuster. When you add that with the stainless steel retainer, the lower trim panel, you put on the armrest and the chrome base and the chrome handle. That is a really rich interior. The cat whisker, it slides right under. So on these ones, it's not attached to the pad itself. What Justin's talking about on the cat whiskers is that is a term that is used in the industry, but side glass seals is more like what it's called. This is a weather strip, so to speak, that has little fuzzies on it. It's kind of a fuzzy little wiper, if you will. It goes onto the door shell itself on the outside and on the inside on the trim panel. What it does is it sandwiches the glass. So when you roll that door glass down, it kind of squeegees it and cleans it on its way down, roll it back up. So if you've ever had one of those cars on a rainy day or a foggy day, you can roll that thing down and back up again and it kind of squeegees it off. So one of the first things that I install is the upper retaining strip for the lower trim panel. This is a part that I buff to a high shine before I install it. It's designed to hold the top of the lower trim panel solid against the door. The next thing that I install on the door is the upper pad. And the reason why I have to do that is because the remote mirror bezel, if I put the lower pad on first, I wouldn't be able to access that to feed it through the hole and get the washer on there. This can be a bit tricky if you have the cat whisker in place already. Just give them a little pop. The access for this hole for the remote mirror bezel is in the door shell itself. Get the retainer on that. Just rotate it where it needs to be. Right there. Feel it catch. Makes it real nice to be able to tighten this down. Everything's working good. Oh, I gotta put the air cleaner on. Oh, look at this. I love this. They call this a chrome dome. You know who else they call chrome dome? Uh-uh. 
<laughs> Dora looked like this when we were eight. You remember? No. Yeah, eight years old, we come running down there, got a big old shiny spot on his head. I think you're going bald. Now the Chrome Dome air cleaner, the reason that's called the Chrome Dome is it goes on the very top of the engine. It covers both dual fours. It covers most of the engine, really. So I guess it got nicknamed the Chrome Dome. Now I did that for Royal because Royal's bald as an eagle and his head's chrome and it shines like chrome. All right, but in this particular case, I think it's more of a nickname. It was just the chrome air cleaner. 66 to 69 non-cold air induction cars got the chrome dome. But let's say you had a 69 Roadrunner, like our 69 Hemi Roadrunner was. All 426 Hemi Roadrunners are air grabbers. So it has the oval shaped air cleaner. Now in 1970, you didn't have to have cold air induction to get the oval shaped air cleaner. If you go to our burn orange 1970 Charger RT, Hemi four speed 1 to 56 made, and look at that engine, you'll see it's oval, but they never made a cold air induction Charger. Royal had rage issues, man. No. Yes. He cut up my motorcycle seat. Oh, wait, no, that was me. That was you? <laughs> Look at how this just tops out. This is the cherry on the cake, isn't it? Got to put the little filter thing here at the front. 12 o'clock, if you look at my original photos, you'll see that's exactly where that is located. All right. Ding, da, da, ding, da, ding, da, ding, da, ding. Butimus, Lon Maximus. Another neat little thing to point out here is you see on the chrome dome air cleaner that there is a nipple coming off of it that in 1967 would have gone over to the breather. But if you look at the breather on this engine, there is no nipple provision for that hose. But yet the nipple is actually on the air cleaner. All that got from the factory is a cap on it. That was something they knew they were gonna do the following year, but wasn't implemented yet in 66. So if you look at those pictures of Tony's 1966 Survivor satellite, you'll see all they did was a little cap over it with a clamp. Well, Dougie, who would have ever thought we'd be working on old hemispherical engines? Yeah, we dreamed about them our whole life, right? We did. I'm surprised your dad didn't buy you one. Usually, whatever Dougie wanted, Dougie got. That was the way it was. That's Mark's story. Well, <laughs> also has a lot to do with history. history. Facts. Only guy in the world that had his bicycle stolen and was rewarded for it by getting a brand new black and white 10 inch television. He also talks about how I get a television set for my 10th birthday as a reward for my bicycle being stolen. No, not even. I think there was years difference between those two. Really? Yeah. Sure there was. You're making it all up. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, I remember this really well. Okay. So Dougie's daddy gave him a Stingray bicycle from Sears. It was cool. Had the long forks on it, little Springer shocks in the front, had a three-speed shifter up here, had the drag slick. I mean, it was a cool bike. But Dougie didn't care because he had things given to him, right? So he leaves it out at the Big Game Shopping Center and somebody steals it. So he goes running home after he discovers, comes out of there with whatever money his dad gave him to go in there and buy things with. He comes out to discover that the bicycle is gone. He goes running up the hill to his dad. Dad, dad, somebody stole my bike. Easy, son, easy, easy. We'll make it right. Takes him right over to Sears and buys him the state-of-the-art 10-inch black and white TV for his bedroom. That was later on. I got a 10-inch portable black and white TV set for my 10th birthday. Yeah, I remember the ad for it. It was a full-page ad. I wanted it. It was beautiful. After that, every time I went over to Doug's house, he was hole up in his room watching Creature Feature on his little thing. You want to come out and play? No, I'm watching Creature Feature. Well, I don't get to watch Creature Feature, okay? I get to watch a dead dad. What? <laughs> oh, here's something while he's working on that. See that little drain plug right there? 1968 was the last year of that plug. In 69, this is just a machined off area. They don't use the drain plug. You had to take the cover off to be able to drain it out. 11 inch heavy duty drums. Nice. Very nice. I like them. Date coded original 18 spline four speed. Everything that you see on this drivetrain is original to the car, except that, as Tony would say, we took the Liberty. There's another Liberty I took, a couple really. Another Liberty we took with the car. Here we go again with another Liberty I took. 
of changing out the flywheel starter and bell housing. Originally, it was an 11-inch cast iron bell housing, 11-inch flywheel, and it used a gear reduction starter. All the four-speed cars did. This particular case, those are hard parts to find. You pay way too much money for them, and really, the starter isn't that dependable like the later ones are. So we changed it over to the 70s style that uses a 10-and-a-half-inch bell housing flywheel and a normal starter. We're going to move this outside and get ready to install it in our 1966 Charger. Okay, so Doug, you want to lower it down just a little bit and we'll line up these perches. Working with my little cousin Dougie today. I admit that this is the first time I've installed a Hemi in a 66 Charger. I don't know what to expect and I'm really glad to have Mark helping me because he's done all of these things. We had a rough weekend, didn't we? Yes, we did. Although somebody told Dougie he was the star of the show, which has gone to his head and now he's untenable. Star of what show? What? Star of a show? Oh, now, you know, I, I think this is cute. This is cute. It was a few weeks ago, Doug's wife came up, Margo, I love her, sweetheart, heart of gold, salt of the earth, and she was saying that all of her feedback on the show this season is how Dougie has become the star of the show. You, you guys are Facebook fans. We have three and a half million fans on Facebook. Why don't you go in there and say who the star of the show is? If it's Dougie, that's great. I'm not paying him anymore. I'm pretty lined up here. Possibly the floor is in the way on this one. There we go, got it. Oh, nice. You got yours? I did. Beautiful, let's put a nut on there. All we need to do is get the front spring hangers positioned in place, put the nuts on from the torque box, tighten them down, and then we'll lower the car down, put the rear shackles in place, do the shocks, and that's about it. You guys had a biological child today, didn't you? I think you did. We have a son. You do have a son. We well, have a wonderful son. His name is John. That's true. What's your first name? John. You, you named your son after you? What's his middle name? Same as mine. <laughs> this is one of those things I just don't understand, OK? It doesn't change anything. It doesn't make them better than the other kids. It's not even a tribute, really. It's not. It's just confusing for the families down the road. Why do you think Cousin Dougie is Cousin Dougie and not Cousin Doug? Because his dad's Doug. They named me Mark Gregory, Mark from the Bible. Gregory, Gregory Peck, Mormon. I don't get it, I don't understand it. You're gonna have a kid, name it anything but your name. Moses probably had kids, right? I'm gonna guess he did. He didn't name him Moses. That would have been confusing for the Bible reader. So with the upper trim panel and the lower trim panel retainer in place, I can install the lower trim panel. Rock it up into place. Pop it up in there. Here's our one piece door trim panel. You know, it's not super fancy, but one cool thing about the chargers, and this is another charger only thing, is it has the storage pouch right on the side, which is really cool. You're not gonna see that on your Roadrunners. You're not gonna see that on your GTXs, your Cornets or anything like that. So that's a really cool feature. So here's a cool little factoid when it comes to that map pocket, all right? 1968 Charger didn't come with an SE. It did come with the map pocket. 1969 Charger came as an SE or a non-SE. Both models had the map pocket. In 1970, the only way you got the map pocket is if you got a Charger Special Edition, A47, in case you're wondering what that is. That would give you the map pocket. We used to put all kinds of stuff down in there. Royal put his... There is a series of clips on the bottom of the trim panel that hold it in place. This is so that there won't be any screws showing and it gives it a really nice clean look. It is very important that the holes in the clips are lined up perfectly or else something really bad could happen. When it comes to the rest of the door assembly parts, it's all pretty much the same. You got your armrest bases, chrome base, your armrest pad, you know, standard. Your door handle, pretty standard. Your window crank your window crank washer, and just the bolts to hold on the handle.
So it's really important that you clock these window crank handles in the right position. On the left side of the car, it's gonna be at your five o'clock, and on the right side of the car, it's just a mirror image, and it's gonna be at your seven o'clock position. Let me grab this little critter and see if we can get anything out of this. Okay, oh, here we go. Oh, this is nicely lined up, isn't it? Well, oh, I do pretty good, don't I? Not too shabby. For a not beginner. too shabby. Okay, so right now we have the leaf spring perches at the front, the hangers, if you will, in place, and he's doing the shackles at the back. After that, we'll raise it up, get the engine out from underneath it, because this is gonna be going in next, but we're gonna do that one a little bit differently. We're gonna use a forklift. These things are so tight in there, we need the articulation. Can I use that word? Sure. The articulation of a forklift, because you gotta tip it forward and backward and side to side. So that's how we're gonna install it, but first we'll put our shocks on. That'll wrap up the rear end. We'll move to the front. That's my little cousin Dougie down there. <laughs> articulation. Yeah. Articulation, that's Can right. Can I keep saying that? If you need to. <laughs> articulation. Yeah. Articulation. It's gonna be a long night, Tom Vick. It's gonna be a long week. Mark says I have a hard time staying focused. You gotta try spending a day with Mark. Raise the car up. Raise the car up. Raise the car guys up. about that friend of mine that had a wonky eye. One minute with him, he's talking about one thing, and then five seconds later, he's on to something else. You take his glasses off. But can you tell if I'm looking at you or looking at Dougie? I'm looking at the camera, I'm looking at Dougie? No. Then he put them back on, and they just go back to perfect. Is that weird? It's nonstop mental leapfrog. So what you see Doug doing right now is he's raising up the right hand side leaf spring. The reason we don't do both sides at the same time is this is a hemi suspension, and that means it has seven leaf springs on the right hand side, six on the left hand side. That's heavy duty stuff that keeps it from having what they call axle wrap. However, that's a very stiff leaf spring package. So if you were to put a pogo stick underneath the center of the differential and try to raise both sides up, which is about three inches to be able to put the shock on, you just push the car off the lift. But if you go over and do one side at a time, if you raise that area right underneath the leaf spring on just the right side, it will go up. It will articulate up into the opening. You can put the shock on it, let it down, go do the other side. That's all we're talking about with that. So now I move on to the quarter trim panels. The quarter interior trim is very similar to the doors. I start with the upper retainer for the lower pad. It's just like the one on the door, but much shorter. The galvanized part that you see above the retainer is something that I put on earlier. It's the bracket for the upper pad, and without it, the pad would have nothing to adhere to. So if you're putting together a basket case charger, don't forget that piece. All right, these ones are a little tricky. You gotta kinda pop it in place, roll it around. So just like the door, the next thing that I put on is the upper trim panel. There you go. Once the upper trim panel is in place, I install the lower trim panel. So for the quarter trim lower panels, you've got these guys right here. They are nothing special, just a one piece, armrest base, and then the window crank handle. That's all you need for these. And as for building out the rest of the assemblies, just your standard bases, armrest pads, window crank handles, and washers. This part also uses the same clips as the doors. And just make sure that the holes in the clips are lined up before you pat it into place. And once I finish this side, I duplicate it on the other side. Hey ghouls, in a previous season of Graveyard Cars, we restored this beautiful EW1 Alpine White Plymouth Superbird 440 Super Commando. True or false? Because of NASCAR rules, only 503 of these cars were made. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned. Right after the break, I'll let you know how you did. All right, welcome back, ghouls. How did you do on that one? Were there only 503 of the Plymouth Superbirds built? If you said true, well, you're wrong. 
but it's a little bit tricky. Don't feel too bad. The fact is that in order for Dodge to race the Daytona at NASCAR, 500 street units had to be built. They ended up making 503. However, in 1970, NASCAR changed the rules. In order for Plymouth to run the Superbird, they had to make available one car for every two dealerships in the country. Therefore, a total of 1,920 Superbirds were made. This particular car was the base color EW1 Alpine White and the standard 440 Super Commando with the 727 Torque Flight. Now, this is one of the things I'm really kind of getting fond of the forklift versus the regular installation car. One is it allows us to work at a regular height where we're not down on the ground. So we can get this car up in the air, get the engine up in the air. It gives us a lot of room to move around. The other thing is there's some movement in those forks. We have 10 foot fork extension. So we lift the cradle up with it. It allows us to push it that half an inch or an inch each way, tip it forward or tip it backwards, depending where the K member lines up on it. So I'm really starting to kind of like it. It's not as pretty as the way that we've done it in the past, but I think it's more efficient. So as far as overall, the centering of the engine side to side is good. I mean, obviously there'll be some finite movement once we get in there. It's gonna be a really, really tight fit. <laughs> it, and it may even be that it has to go up at an angle. Uh, Next time we should put the valve covers on last. Okay, so it needs to shift to the left. Okay. As you go up, there you go. Okay, let's raise her up. This is interesting. About halfway through this install, I got to thinking, this car doesn't have power steering. It's always trying to get the power steering style K-member with the 426 Semi up into position that is so challenging. Go back and watch the misery of that 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner, the 426 Semi Automatic 1 of 1 Turquoise Q5 car. It was a nightmare getting that into place. Now, part of it was when I was trying to push the actual rack back, I was holding the rack while I was trying to push it away from me, which makes me a complete idiot. But even if it wasn't that fact, it was very difficult to get that drivetrain in place. Up a little more. Ooh, what was that noise? Well, I don't know. I don't either. I'm not down there. That's tight. We've got a quarter of an inch on that side. Even without the power steering gear, take a look from the top down as they're showing that. Watch that engine coming up into the cavity real slow. You'll see that those valve covers only have a few thousandths between the valve cover and the shock tower. That's how close they are. That's why Doug and I were saying earlier, maybe next time we'll leave the valve covers off, put it in, and then put the valve covers on later. There isn't much wiggle room on that. Okay, let's raise her a little more. Okay. These engines are so tight, you almost have to wiggle them into place. Okay, we need to come in two inches. Is this side sway bar hitting or no? No. You sure? Yeah. Okay. There. So with the trim panels in place, I can install the back seats. These are new covers from Classic Industries. They're exact replicas of the originals. Now the back seats are all vinyl, but since this is an SERT special edition, the front seats will have leather inserts and I'll show you when we get to them. The window cranks clock just like the doors. With the trim panels and the back seat installed, I can install the dash next. The dash assembly in all these cars go in the same. So you hang the dash on the pivot points, then you go and you make all your connections, your defroster, your heater, your wiring, etc. Then you can roll it up into place and make your final connections. Now that I have the dash installed, I was able to install the steering column, and boom, we got a charger again. Next, I will install the console in the seats and the inside will be finished. Hey, uh, camera, can you guys this, this right here, Mark? I'll show you. Right there? Right over the top, right here. Um, you got a ball cap? All right, here we go. Here we go. Hollywood. So that's got to go back a little bit. Where's the hole? <sighs> oh, <sighs> <sighs> Perfect. 
Well, you know, everybody knows I love the old movies. I don't know how much of it's fantasy and how much of it's real, right? If Will can put a magic hat on and all of a sudden lay out a paint job that he normally couldn't do, why couldn't Sylvester Stallone turn his hat around and get power out of it? Stallone, because when he would do arm wrestling and he needed an extra little bit of strength, he'd, he'd get all into position. <laughs> and then... Yeah. He needs to watch some newer movies. I wonder if he's seen Bad Santa 2. i put my hat back on in case I need that strength again. No, I don't think it's necessary that I need to watch newer movies. What, so I can quote them too? Maybe, just maybe, they should watch the older movies. Because you can learn something from the older movies. First off, you can appreciate my brilliant references, like so many of you, thank you, at home, do. T-shirts, stuff like that. But also, I've used some of the things that I've seen in these movies as survival tips, all right? But what if they get caught in a situation where there's a crazy killer on campus, right? They're at a party and they go to get another beer and, and Will says to everybody, hey guys, I'll be right back. You don't do that, all right? They made that very clear in the movie Scream. Never say I'll be right back because you're not gonna be right back. Why do you think Kevin Bacon took a spear up through his chest in Friday the 13th? He had said something clever right before that. Well, actually, I think he made love to that girl and smoked a doobie. But it doesn't matter. You can learn from all this stuff. All right? What you need, guy? Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to align this thing. We got Does a... it have too much pressure on it? No, we got a, a sway bar in the way here. Makes things more difficult. You need to borrow my hat? If you put it on and, and, you, and you move it around backwards, it's a magical hat. Uh... And then you have extra strength and stuff. All right, Tiny? Look at, uh, show a little Tiny. <laughs> my name's Jeffrey. I just don't get this Tiny Dancer thing. Every time he sees me, he's singing this damn song to me. Hold me closely, Tiny Dancer. Count the headlights on the highway. <laughs> Lay me down in the sheet of linens. I know you've had a long day today. He's even signing my paychecks, Tiny Dancer. The banks aren't cashing that. Yeah. Whoa, that was like three inches. Okay. Well, around my house it wasn't. There, okay. right there. Thank you, boss. Despite all of Mark's craziness, we finally got the K-member bolted in, the transmission cross-member bolted in. Thank goodness. Now that we have our drivetrain installed in the 1966 Dodge Charger, 426 Hemi, four speed, ZZ1, one of 250 built with that engine and transmission, one of only one built with those colors, we can move forward to the final assembly of the car. I think all we have left is to tighten up the K-member bolts and the transmission cross-member bolts, and we'll put the torsion bars in, we'll connect the upper control arms and the shocks, we can let it down. We've got some cool, cool blue streak tires. Look over here. 66 Charger got a blue streak tire. Is that beautiful? Yes. And it's only a 14, <laughs> and it gets a full wheel cover on it, what they call the spinners. So I'm looking forward to getting this thing down on the ground and moving it around. Yes. Good job, Rooster. Thank you, Mark. What I do is I take my hat, I turn it around, and it's like a switch that goes on. Lincoln Hawk, over the top. Words of wisdom, Lloyd. Words of wisdom. The Shinnin.